It's a pleasure to welcome our uh, colloquium speaker today, uh, Professor Nikhil Padmanabhan, uh, who is visiting us from Yale. In fact, Nikhil is no stranger to these parts and did his uh, doctoral work here, uh, followed by a brief stint as Hubble Fellow at Berkeley uh, before arriving at Yale in 2009, where he's been ever since. Uh, Nikhil is an expert in many areas of astrophysics and cosmology, ranging from fuzzy dark matter to large scale structure, and is perhaps best known for uh, or for significant roles and contributions to the theory and practice of spectroscopic galaxy surveys with significant roles in Sloan and the currently running dark energy spectroscopic instrument DESI. Uh, Nikhil is a particular expert in the measurement of cosmological distances using baryon acoustic oscillations, which he will tell us about today. So let's do that. That's on and it's not too loud, I hope. Uh, Good, okay, uh, it's a pleasure to be back uh, out here. Let's make sure that that works, good. Uh, and, and sort of talk to you about what I've been working on. Uh, a lot of, lots of things that started in some form or the other when I was a graduate student here and I've just sort of continued doing uh, many years uh, into the future. So what I'll do today is walk you through some of the recent results from uh, the DESI survey and give you a little bit of a sneak peek into what's going on there, uh, as well as talk about some of the work that my group has been doing, thinking about baryon acoustic oscillations. I'll, I'll walk you through various pieces of all of this. A lot of this is driven by the fact that we're today in a sort of industrial age of galaxy surveys. So this is a Moore's law version of uh, galaxy surveys as a function of time versus numbers of redshift. There's a power law slope out here, and you can sort of see from the earliest redshift surveys all through sort of Sloan, two, Sloan 1 and 2, uh, where uh, I sort of worked as a graduate student to Sloan 3 uh, through DESI. And we've sort of just been following this uh, large trend as the number of redshifts just keep increasing with time. And the, 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 the advantage of gaining all of this is we're starting to probe a much wider range of redshifts with a wider range of redshifts, we get to sort of larger scales, we get to larger scale modes uh, in cosmology, as well as more modes. So we get tighter and tighter cosmological constraints. And so one of the, one of the great gains in, that's all right, uh, I didn't steal anyone. Uh, 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 one, of the, uh, one of the great gains that we've had in this process is uh, that we, you know, the cosmological constraints just get tighter and tighter. In the same period of time, uh, we've sort of gone from just having single probe measurements over some of these regions to having multiple probes going over the same pieces. And so part of the story here is a story about increasing statistical precision, but it's also a story about better systematic control uh, on this data. So here's my plan for today. And I sort of promised three different threads uh, in, in, the, in the, my talk. I'm gonna show you uh, some of the work that's going on with the, the survey that I'm most currently involved with, the DESI survey. I'll show you some of the early results that we've published from DESI, as well as a flavor of what we're trying to get done in the next six months or so. So uh, our year one uh, analyses in particular, our year one BA analyses. I'll then change gears a little bit and give you a, a, a little bit of a sense of some of the theoretical ideas that we've been playing with uh, in my group, uh, thinking about how do you extend density field reconstruction to try to go back to the initial conditions. And I'll show you some re results that we have uh, from all of that. And so we'll just see how far along that line uh, we get to. So a lot of, there's a lot of information in a galaxy survey, and I'm gonna just focus in on one small aspect of that. And that, that aspect is the baryon acoustic oscillation feature in, in, the, in the surveys. These baryon acoustic oscillations are sound waves in the early universe that get imprinted uh, they're the same sound waves that drive the cosmic microwave background that has led to sort of the most precise uh, cosmological constraints that we have. But those sound waves also get imprinted in the galaxy distribution, and they form a standard ruler that you can use. And the standard ruler is either seen in the power spectrum as a sequence of wiggles, with the standard ruler sort of being the wavelength of these wiggles, or in the correlation function which I Fourier transformed this to get a feature in this correlation function at about 100 H inverse megaparsecs out here. And so 
if I have a standard ruler, I can put the standard ruler down at different redshifts and measure what the expansion history of the universe is. If I put the ruler perpendicular to my line of sight, I measured basically the angular diameter distance. I'm measuring an angle at a bunch of different redshifts. So I measure the angular diameter distance as a function of redshift parallel to the line of sight. I'm really measuring what the Hubble parameter is doing as a function of redshift. And once I've told you either the angular diameter distance or the Hubble parameter, you've learned something about what the background cosmology is doing. And hopefully things about what, for instance, the equation of state of, dark, of the dark energy is that's driving the ex expansion of the acceleration of the universe. So the goal out for a lot of what I'm going to show you is how well can we measure these measurements and what, what do these measurements look like? Before I show you the DESI results, I wanted to actually show you sort of state of the art that came just before DESI, which was from the EBOS survey. And so this is a Hubble diagram that sort of maps out the expansion history of the universe shown in this standard ruler, both perpendicular and parallel to the line of sight. You can see the BAO measurements, and then you can see the CMB measurements out here, uh, all the way out at a redshift of about 1100. Uh, the CMB measurement is on the same scale as the BAO measurements because they're the same standard ruler. It's the same sound horizon scale that you use in both pieces. And you can use that to sort of map from a redshift of 1100 all the way down to the sort of low redshift measurements that we have from the BAO measurements here. At the same time, you can do these standard ruler measurements uh, in a different way, which is not, not, not using a standard ruler, but now a standard candle here, and map a Hubble diagram starting off at redshift zero and work your way out. And so you get two, stand, you get two Hubble diagrams out here. You get a Hubble diagram that starts off at redshift 1100 and moves down, and then you get one that moves up. Michael. You're telling that the Hubble diagram is going to point to the axis. Ah, good, yes. Uh, uh, I'm, uh, this, is, uh, this is a Hubble diagram where I've taken the expansion history or the distance scale or either the Hubble parameter or the distance and divided out by a fiducial uh, distance where the fiducial distance is some standard Lambda CDM-like cosmology. So one is, in this case, Lambda CDM with Planck-like uh, uh, parameters, and everything else is a deviation from that, that piece. And what you can actually see, and, uh, and this was, uh, it's a good point to make out here, is you can see that different redshifts get you probes at diff with different levels of accuracy for different kinds of models. So for instance, the dotted line here, this one was lambda CDM. That's the reference that we have. We can say, let me allow for some curvature, and you get dashed line, the, the red dashed line out here. And now you can see that you're a lot more sensitive to curvature at higher redshift than you are at lower redshift. That's when it dominates. You could turn on uh, a varying equation of state, and you get something that has that green line out here, which the equation of state of dark energy matters a lot more at lower redshift, and so you get more sensitivity out there. And then, of course, you can now start varying things like what the neutrinos are doing out there. And if you add in a, a small neutrino mass, you change that uh, variant out there as well. So you get various pieces out here. Yeah. The correlation between the BL perpendicular and uh, parallel measurements, it seems like the first three points going up, going down, and then later the last one lower and higher. There, is there a simple explanation? There, there is at some level from the fact that you basically, when you do the perpendicular and parallel pieces, you are, you, you know, it's the same standard ruler that you're sort of wrapping around in both pieces. So if you just ask what you would predict, you do get an anti-correlation if you plot this in the right in the right units. If you if you plot H versus one over H, you can flip that sign out here. Good. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, so that's what the expansion history of the universe looks like uh, pre the Desi survey, and uh, I'll, I'll sort of give you a flavor of what this looks will look like as we move towards Desi. Uh, one of the things I did want to show out here, this is still talking about pre-DESI measurements, is what does the BAO measurement actually say about things like this Hubble tension out here? And so I just want to spend a minute just walking you through this diagram. So this is the standard ruler scale, so the actual physical scale of the standard ruler, as well as the Hubble, the Hubble constant, so scaled all the way down to redshift zero today. So the BAO measurements really measure a combination of these two pieces because you're always measuring an angle. So you need to convert, take this measurement 
and sort of look at the product of those two. And it's that product that you actually measure. And so you'll see the BAO contour really tells you this band that you have out here. What I wanted to make a couple of different points out with this. The, the first one is, I can say, so this doesn't actually tell me anything about either the Hubble parameter, the Hubble parameter or the sound horizon or the, 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 the sort of drag epoch or the, the standard ruler scale. But if I put in a prior, that prior could be from the CMB, which is this tiny little prior out there. The CMB very tightly constrains what that scale is. And you get the standard issue with the Hubble tension that you have from the CMB. But I can also do something else, which is I can say, let me throw out the CMB. Let me believe that I don't actually trust the CMB measurement. Sorry, Joe. Uh, and, and I can say, let me just put in a BBN prior out here. Because the sound horizon is really just set by how much, what's your baryon to dark matter ratio that you have? How, much, how many baryons do you have? And if you put that prior in here, you also get a value that is consistent with the CMB values. The error bars are larger, but you get something which is consistent out here. I could also turn this around completely and say, let me not work, let me imagine that that's, I'm not gonna say any constraints on the sound horizon, but let me put some constraint on the Hubble parameter and say, what does that tell me about the sound horizon? And if I take the Hubble parameter measurements from, for instance, the distance ladder, I get a sound horizon that is very, very much in tension with what I would get either from BBN or the CMB. So the, the point here is not that the BAO is going to solve the H0 tension out here, but I wanted to highlight that the H0 tension exists well beyond just thinking about just the CMB measurements alone. I can throw out the CMB completely and I still end up with an H0 tension. The second part of the story, of course, is how does future surveys, how will they improve or how, what will they say about this H0 tension? So if I reduce the error bar in my measurements, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this contour and just make that tighter and tighter, right? So I'm not going to actually break, change that contour around in any way. And so qualitatively, I'm not gonna solve any version of this. But if I have a systematic error that I would like to understand in, for instance, the, the BAO measurements, that systematic error could move things up or down. And that would, of course, change where I would sort of intersect on, this, on these curves and could have something to do with what the h naught tension was. And so one of the pieces that we'd like to do is not only reduce the error bar, the statistical errors here, but also reduce the systematic error and make sure that you know, that contour is exactly where we think that contour is and not sort of slid up or down in some, some level. OK, so let me start by showing you some early results uh, from the DESI survey. Uh, so this is a one-slide introduction to uh, the to Desi. Desi is in in many ways the sort of uh, follow-on survey, the the sort of obvious follow-on that you would get if you said take Sloan and just keep expanding Sloan by various factors. So you you have this is on the Kitt Peak four meter telescope uh, with uh, it's a fiber-fed uh, spectrograph with five thousand fibers. Uh, going up from the Sloan 600-ish fibers to the BOSS 1,000. These fibers are, are positioned by, with a robotic fiber positioner that you can see out here. So you basically can point at a chunk of sky uh, and get 5,000 spectra at a single shot. And the idea is basically do a very large scale survey of the universe starting at a redshift zero. And I'll show you the redshift range we cover in a second, all the way out to a redshift about three and a half in the in tra traced with the quasars, and if you do a survey like this, the, the the you you can measure things like a Hubble diagram where you can actually map out the expansion history of the universe in incredibly fine bins over an incredibly large range uh, of redshifts out here, uh, and that sort of corresponds to a BAO distance scale which is below one percent in multiple redshift bins between a redshift of about a half to about three. So we really are talking about sort of sub percent precision measurements uh, over a very large redshift range, trying to sort of go from the previous expansion history slide that I showed you to what we have today. Uh, so this is, this is the first two months of DESI. So as we started thinking about the analysis of the DESI data, one of the pieces that we were concerned about was making sure that we didn't, didn't sort of put our thumb on the data in any way or analysis in any way to sort of choose a particular value of 
the uh, cosmological parameters that we wanted. So we had decided we would blind our data and, and, and not actually look at the results until we had sort of passed the whole sequence of systematics uh, tests. But just to sort of make sure that everything was working well, we said, we'll take the first two months of data and we'll leave those data unblinded. And so uh, we took those two months of data and we said, let's quickly analyze those and see how well things work. So this is the first two months out of a five year survey of data. Uh, this is the sky coverage uh, that we got for the first two months. The results that I'm showing you are in this paper by Jung and Moon. Uh, you can see we've sort of covered, we covered a few thousand square degrees of sky with not uniform completeness across the entire piece. But we've got redshifts that run over, you can sort of see our full redshift range with various traces covering different pieces. So let me just walk you through this slide, this, this histogram here. This is the, the lowest redshift sample is the sort of bright galaxy sample, which in many ways is really the, the sort of uh, uh, follow on to Sloan. It's a magnitude limited sample, but now going to a magnitude limit of about 19.5. So it's much fainter than sort of two magnitudes fainter than the Sloan sample out here. Uh, the luminous red galaxy sample builds off all of the things we learned with both Sloan and Boss, but now pushes out to a redshift of about one. And then we get emission line galaxies that pick, out, uh, pick up about redshift 0.8, go out to a redshift of about 1.6. And then we have quasars that basically start at about redshift 0.8, where we effectively can ca capture them and run all the way out to 3.5. We use the sort of low redshift quasars just as galaxies and the high redshift quasars both as galaxies and also tracers of the Lyman Alpha forest out here. Uh, there are lots of numbers here. I'm not gonna walk you through the, the various numbers except to, fact, to point out that a lot of these numbers, for instance, the LRG numbers, this is the numbers in the north and the, and the south uh, that we had uh, as the survey ran. These numbers in two months of data, I think Michael will probably notice that there may be a factor of a few larger than what Sloan got by the end of the, the full Sloan survey. So just a, just a sense of how much the surveys have gotten uh, better. And here are the correlations from the first two months of data. So this is, uh, the, the, these data are all public. Uh, now uh, you can see for the bright galaxy sample, you can see a little BAO feature out here. Uh, luminous red galaxy samples shows a very nice feature. The emission line galaxies, I'll, you can, we can have a long discussion about whether there was a feature that we saw or not, certainly consistent with the feature. Uh, this is the least complete sample that we have. And so there was no surprise that in two months of data, we wouldn't see this. And the quasars, again, the number, the short noise and number densities were low enough that this was, this was perfectly what uh, we had expected. Uh, and so what we said was, Given that these were our most complete samples, let's go ahead and analyze and see how good the distances were that we got from there. And so I'm gonna take both of these and show you the results from those. Uh, one of the, the little uh, caveats out here with the results I'm gonna show you, we, these are unblinded data. So these correlation functions are not shifted around in any way. But when we said we would convert this to an actual distance measurement, we worried a little bit or management worried a little bit about the fact that we would unfortunately start unblinding ourselves a little early. So for the year one data, so I'm not gonna show you the, res I'm not gonna show you an absolute distance scale. I'm going to show you a, a, a number which is centered around one, but I'll tell you what the error bars are. And so here are the luminous red galaxy sample out here. Here's the correlation function. You'll see there are two correlation functions. There's what I call a pre-reconstructed correlation function, which is this, lightly shaded one, but the post reconstructed one, which is what I'll talk about in the second half of my talk, uh, is one where we sort of try to reduce the systematic errors and increase the statistical power of the sample by sort of undoing some of the nonlinear evolution that happens to the data. And you can see both versions of this. Uh, this figure here shows you sort of chi squared as a function of alpha. Alpha is our way of sort of characterizing the distance to a particular redshift. It's relative to some fiducial distance out there. And as I just promised, I was not going to tell you what that fiducial distance is. So you can't do any cosmology with this, but you can see it's centered around whatever value we chose to center it around for this figure. Uh, and so the solid line just shows you as you vary this distance scale, what is, the, what is our chi-squared or what is our likelihood surface over that region? And so this is giving you a sense of what the error bar is. The dotted lines here show you the same figure of the same 
piece where I imagine there is no BAO feature in the correlation function. So the difference between these uh, lines at sort of the lowest piece here gives you a sense of what the, the overall sensitivity to the BAO feature is or the, the, the significance of the BAO detection. And you can see this is about a five sigma detection uh, of the BAO feature. And you can convert this error here into about a 1.7% distance measurement with this luminous red galaxy sample, which was again at the same level of accuracy as what we had achieved with the Sloan data from two pieces. Yep. Uh, I, we chose a, we, 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 we were not blinded. We were, we were not publishing the results, so we didn't look at the results. So yes, the, the data are unblinded but we didn't want to publish results to have people writing papers on cosmology with the year one sample. So we cheated a little bit. Great, not the C, sure. <laughs> Which is, I think, Michael. The reconstruction, I'm struck by the fact that the, the reconstruction, at least in this part, doesn't seem to make a big difference. Uh, that story will change. Uh, that's, uh, that story will certainly change. Uh, I will sort of say, uh, you probably will remember this and some, some others will remember, uh, it seems like the, our first analyses of luminous red galaxies always seems with new surveys, never seems to produce an improvement on, with reconstruction the first time round, just from statistical fluctuations. Uh, this happened with BOSS and this happened again with DESI. And we, there's, there's clearly something jinxed, but I, I don't know what that is. Uh, here's, the, here's the same sample with the, the, the bright galaxy sample. This is, remember, the magnitude limited sample at lower redshift. Uh, this covers a smaller volume, so the error bars are larger, but here you can actually see a, a clear improvement with reconstruction. So you can see here the error bars, this curve here now is a much sharper curve post-reconstruction than it is pre-reconstruction out here. And so this is a 2.6% measurement. So even with the first two months of data, we were able to sort of get you a sort of 2.6 and a 1.7% distance measurement at sort of the rough effective redshifts of both of the samples. So around a redshift of about 0.3 and a redshift of a closer to 0.8. Okay, so now let me show you a, a little bit of a flavor of the year one uh, BAO analyses that are ongoing. Now, all of this is blinded data. So I will show you correlation functions, but the scales are, are have been sort of shifted around. So you can't try to read any cosmology directly off these figures. So here are the year one correlation functions running from the bright galaxy sample, the luminous red galaxy sample now split, split into multiple redshift bins. Uh, the emission line sample, as well as uh, the quasars. Uh, these are pre-reconstructed samples. I'll show you the post-reconstructed correlation functions in a second. But they're all sort of shifted so that they're all on the same physical co-moving scale out here. And you can see, uh, you can clearly see a BAO feature that's sort of lining up across all of these. So certainly at the level of staring at a bunch of correlation functions, they all have a BAO feature. and They all line up at roughly the right scale. Michael. Yeah. Um, think of each of these curves as independent, more or less independent from Pretty each much. other. Yeah. 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 And, and how many square degrees, how much data does this represent? In fact? Square degrees and numbers of objects and stuff. Uh, I, let me look up those numbers and not try to make up. It's, thousand, it's a few thousand square degrees, but let me know, let's give you the exact numbers later. Uh, here is the reconstructed. So uh, you can you can see these these are sort of the correlation functions. We can sort of zoom in on just the BAO piece out of this and and sort of just highlight just the sort of uh, scale the correlation function. So you can see the BAO feature. And so here's again a Hubble diagram, much like the previous Hubble diagram that I'd shown you. So again, divided out by some mean value out here. And these are of course just the galaxy pieces out here. And you can see starting off with the blinded, uh, the, the bright galaxy sample, uh, the luminous red galaxy samples, an ELG sample, as well as a quasar sample all the way out there. Uh, so the, the, the piece to really take away from this is sort of the error bars. Don't try to read anything into the scatter that happens out here because none of the, 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 the central values of these points are, are all blinded to you. Uh, one of the pieces that uh, uh, Desi will also get you a measurement and as did Boss, 
uh, was a measurement from the quasars. And so the quasars uh, from the Lyman Alpha Forest go to even further redshift. So they provide an interesting anchor, but I'm, I'm really going to focus here on the galaxy uh, piece. So this is what it will look like. The error bars are probably pretty close to the final versions of the error bars. And as soon as we're ready, we'll sort of put them all, hopefully they'll, they'll either lie directly on this line uh, and everyone will say that's exactly what you'd expected, or they will lie completely off the line, in which case we will have something interesting to think about. Um, one piece of this process, as I told you, one of, our, one of our questions has been, you know, not just beat down on the statistical error, but beat down on the systematic error. And so a, a big part of the work that we've been doing is sort of trying to understand what the various places where systematic errors can leak into uh, those measurements are, how well have we understood what we're doing to these measurements. And so there's not just the, the sort of measurements that I showed you right here, but there's a whole host of papers that run from sort of theoretical systematics that Stephen is uh, what, one of the leaders of uh, here through thinking about reconstruction, testing robustness to various galaxy models that we have, testing robustness to cosmology, the observational systematics, making sure we get error bars and things like that. Uh, I'm putting up the slide really to highlight there's a large number of people whose real work that I'm standing up here and, and presenting, uh, as well as there's a bunch of people who are in green who are on the job market this year. So if you're looking at postdoctoral applications, uh, a lot of these people are uh, uh, looking for postdocs. So let me give you a little bit of a flavor of the kinds of things we're thinking about here. So this is uh, work that Stephen uh, is leading with Cullen Howlett. Uh, these are sort of the theoretical systematics. And when I say theoretical systematics here, uh, when I think about the BAO measurement, I'm really talking about what does nonlinear gravitational evolution do to the standard ruler? How does it change and shift the standard ruler around? This has been work that we have spent a lot of time sort of thinking about. Uh, there was original work by Martin Croce and Roman Scotchamara, work by uh, Blake Sherwin and Matthias back in 2012, and some work that I did with Martin. Uh, white, and you can see uh, th the various curves out here, the, the dashed curve is the original BAO linear theory curve, and then the various other curves here are scaled versions of sort of the, BA the effect of nonlinear evolution on the BAO feature. And so you can, you get wiggles in the nonlinear evolution from various pieces in nonlinear structure formation that can shift the BAO feature. You'll notice they don't perfectly line up with the linear theory curve. And so you could shift where the BAO feature is. You can translate all of that, Michael. That's a power spectrum. That is a power spectrum. Normalized. Normalized just to take out the BAO feature, uh, just to highlight the BAO feature, exactly. Um, what's, uh, what I can do there is that I can take these, the, the theoretical understanding here and convert it, for instance, into how much would my error in a distance scale shift as a function of redshift and as a function of different galaxy bias parameters in real space and redshift space, adding in nonlinear biasing. And you can see that if you don't think about it at all, you can get some reasonable scatter depending on what the biasing model is and things like that. All of these scatters get smaller at higher redshift because nonlinear structure formation gets weaker as you go to a higher redshift, but you can get some reasonable scatter out here. This is, of course, that, that scatter is assuming I know nothing about any of these pieces. And as, what, what the, as I will argue to you later, is a lot of these shifts in the BAO scale, because these are really shifts in the standard ruler scale, all of these post-reconstruction go to zero. And I'll talk a little bit about that. You can also think about more exotic uh, forms of systematics that come from, for instance, the fact that the baryons and the dark matter have different velocities uh, at uh, recombination. Those give you much smaller shifts. So these are percent level shifts. These are now sub percent level, much, much smaller than sub percent level shifts. Again, all we're trying to do here is sort of track down each of these systematics to as much level uh, as as high a level of accuracy. So the pre the, pre the precision we're aiming for for year one is about a percent, and you can see a lot of these effects are much smaller than uh, a percent. They were our goal is to keep our systematics down at the sort of 0.1 percent level if we can. Uh, I can do this now also as a function of different ways of populating uh, the uh, how do I populate galaxies relative to the dark matter. Uh, 
just to give you an example out here, I'm not going to sort of walk you through the 15 different models that happen out here, but these are models for the emission line galaxies. And here you can see these models, both pre and post reconstruction. These are distance scales now in a slightly different, not perpendicular and parallel, but an isotropic and uh, sort of what's the alcock uh version of these. And you can see there are actual shifts, which are consistent to the shifts that I showed you previously, the same sort of magnitude uh, of shifts that you had pre-reconstruction. But if I go from pre to post-reconstruction, those shifts basically go down to zero uh, or zero within the sort of statistical error of the simulations that we have out here for a very large range of models. Now there's, there's actual structure out here from the fact that they are running things on the same sets of simulations. So there's some common large scale structure modes in all of this. But again, the post reconstruction results, one way to think about this is that error bar is sort of below the sort of 0.1% error that we had uh, set as our goal for this. We can do this for the emission line galaxies, but we can do this for the luminous red galaxies and so on. So that's what I wanted to leave you with, with the year one data. Uh, I can't tell you what the final results are, nor can I tell you what the cosmology from those results are. But what I hopefully have shown you is the statistical power of year one is already a huge jump over where we have been before. And where I'm actually even more happy is I think we've got a much better handle on our systematic error budget. We've sort of been able to break that down now into a whole bunch of different pieces. And so hopefully we can tell you what the contour looks like in that H naught RD space, but give you some good sense of the, the sort of throw that you have and moving it up and down. Okay, I'm now gonna sort of change gears a little bit from the sort of here's where the data are to what one might do with these data as I sort of think ahead into the future. And so I've been talking about reconstruction for a whole bunch. And so let me say a few words about what reconstruction is and some ideas on how we might extend it. So the idea of reconstruction is, uh, is, is a simple idea and it really was motivated by trying to do this BAO measurement uh, much better than we would have done if we just looked at the galaxy sample. And so the, the, the idea comes from the, the simple picture out here. So let me, let me do a, a little bit of a thought experiment. Let me imagine the initial conditions of the universe where I paint on just a BAO ring on some sample of objects and just ask, what does nonlinear evolution do to that sample of objects? Well, so here's the initial conditions. Here's my BAO ring. And here's a cross section. So this is the BAO feature sort of drawn in in that piece out here. If I let that just sort of evolve out and just let structure formation take place as it would normally do, you'll see this BAO ring gets distorted. And that distortion does two things. If you sort of look at the profile of this, it widens out the angle average piece, which reduces the, error, uh, the sort of precision in which you can centroid this value out here but it also changes the scale a little bit. You can't see the change in the scale a little bit out here, but it'll shrink the, the scale of the ruler just a little bit out here. You can see from this figure where most of the flows are taking place. So this is, these are the, the flows that are happening out here are sort of large scale flows and the scale, this is a few hundred megaparsecs on a side. And so these, the flows that are happening that for instance, the, the, the particles are being dragged into these overdense regions or evacuated from these underdense regions are flows that are happening on sort of 20 megaparsec scales or so. That, that's the rough scale. Those are roughly quasi linear, linearish scales. And you could imagine saying, can I work out what those flows look like just from the fact that I've measured the density field? And so you can try to do that and you can try to just say, let me just solve the continuity equation and say, I started off from a uniform distribution, I got to this. And so let me run the continuity equation backwards and work out what the flows are. So I can work out the flows from this and then I can run things backwards and try to reconstruct the initial conditions of the BAO feature. And so what you do out here is I can take the, infer the flows out here and then sort of run things backwards and sharpen up the BAO feature. And this is now a pretty standard process that we run on all BAO measurements. We sort of understood what it does to the BAO feature in, in significant detail. Again, uh, Stephen, I think has probably done the most recent work on sort of understanding what reconstruction does to uh, this BAO feature, but we now understand at least at the level of the BAO feature, what it's doing. And it's 
uh, from a survey perspective, what it's doing is it's sharpening up this feature. And so it's making it a, uh, the standard ruler just a more precise standard ruler, both a, a more precise and a more accurate standard ruler in both, both sets of the way. Uh, of course, the, what I'm doing out here is I've sort of told you the story just in the context of the BAO feature, but really what I'm trying to do in some sense is work out what the initial conditions of the universe are. And so the question, the theme of what I'm going to try to go to for the, the rest of this talk is let's imagine, let's first imagine, could I do this reconstruction better to get a better estimate of what the initial conditions are? And then the second part to that question is if you gave me a snapshot of what the initial conditions of the universe look like, what those initial fluctuations look like, what science could I do with that sample of objects, right? So I'd like to, firstly, can we do things better than what we've done before, but also what new science does this enable beyond just the BAO measurements that I showed you out here? So uh, one of the first things that I'm gonna talk about here is a way to sort of do these flows backwards, but now thinking about it in a, in a very geometrical way. And so this is an old idea that sort of, in some ways, it's ideas that go back to people like Zeldovich and Peebles. There have been versions of this uh, idea that uh, David Weinberg and Rupert Croft have worked on. This is work uh, led by my postdoc, Farnik Nikoptar, with uh, a whole host of people along the way. So the question that we want to work out is, how do I figure out what the initial conditions are? And I, I told you, the first version of this was I solved the simple linear continuity equation that I'd written down on that previous slide. But can I do better than that? And so the idea here is the following, and let me do this in two separate versions. So let's start with this lower version. This is really a cartoon version of what happens with structure formation. Start off with some basically uniform distribution of objects where things have some velocities, and those velocities will give rise to sort of the structure that I see today. So if I think about this as a probability distribution, I'm basically mapping a uniform probability distribution to some non-uniform probability distribution of the matter. Right? And so I'm basically conserving mass as I move from the initial conditions all the way to the final conditions. And so I can write down my final condition distribution, my initial conditions distribution. These are just the mass conservation equations. But I know that my initial conditions were uniform. So this is just a uniform distribution out here. And so this, I can ask what mapping goes, takes me from here to there that gives me this piece out here. And I can do a simple piece here, which is let me say that, that mapping is some simple map from the final conditions to the initial conditions with just some potential flow. And this is where we go all the way back to Zeldovich, where we say, just move in straight lines. But is there a straight line motion from one to the other? that gets you from one to the other. And if you say, let me solve that equation, you will end up solving an equation that looks like the equation that I have below here, which is again, a different way of writing mass conservation or probability conservation. So this idea is an, this idea, is an idea which sort of has variance in a whole bunch of fields, including most recently things like machine learning, where people talk about normalizing flows. Normalizing flows is a variant of some of these ideas out here. The oldest piece of this idea goes back to an idea in, in sort of mathematics for called optimal transport, which was this idea of, in, in the version that was originally written down by Gaspar Morge, uh, of how do I move mud from this chunk of earth out here into piles out here? What's the least amount of work that I can do? So that, that was the original framing of this optimal transport idea. Uh, it has variants, uh, it was sort of re-worked re out and reimagined in, in re uh, more recent times, uh, including work by Viktor Kantorovich. He took the idea of moving mud to sort of moving armies from sort of barracks to front lines and what's the least amount of work that you can do. But the question in all of these cases was, again, how do I figure out what the mapping is from sort of some distribution to some other distribution? And it turns out that if I phrase it this way in terms of this motion, or I think about it in terms of what's the optimal transport with some quadratic cost, they solve exactly the same problem. So you can write either version of this problem as there's some simple way to go from 
this distribution out to this, this the further distribution as a mapping problem. So let me give you this mapping problem now in a cosmological framework a little bit more clearly. So what, what I'm trying to do is map the initial conditions to the final conditions. And in some ways, this is an assignment problem. I'm saying, let me start with some initial set of particles and where do those particles end? Well, I have a simulation, let's imagine I had a simulation at both snapshots. I'm really saying, how do particles map from one to the other? How do I sort of draw lines going from one point to another? And so this assignment problem, if I had equal numbers of objects, I'm just sort of mapping one object to an, another object. And I'm trying to minimize the amount of work that I'm doing, where work here is distance moved by any object. So that's the, that's the context out there. If I have equal numbers of objects, it's a straight assignment problem. I can now generalize this. If I start adding more objects at one end to the other, I could say my initial object gets split up into a whole bunch of different objects. And so I can say now each object here maps to four objects, or I can map them to even more objects, or I can run actually into the continuum limit where I say, let me take the distribution of objects that I have and map them to space, all of the sort of uniform space that you have, and ask where do all of those objects come from? And so what you're actually asking is if I have my distribution of galaxies today, where in the initial conditions did those objects come from? What were the sort of proto-Lagrangian patches that collapsed into form the final objects that you see today, the clusters and galaxies that you see today? Where are all of those objects coming from? What's interesting about that, of course, is that's a problem that I can then say, let's look at those proto objects and see what properties do I see in those proto objects and how do they collapse to form the objects that we see today? Are they, are they sort of relatable in some simple way to the objects that we see today? And so you can start to do things like this with surveys where I take a, a, a distribution of objects out here and sort of map them back to what their initial conditions are. And here's just a couple of examples of the sort of mapping that you can do as you run things backwards, where you say, let me take a set of these particles. This is where their final particles were. And all of these particles mapped to these initial particles. And our reconstruction algorithm works out what the shape of that object looked like. So the, the points here are from the simulation. So they're the true original part points of the part uh, of the of the object and the, the sort of tessellation under underlying that is what the reconstruction thought that that object should have looked like and you can see that looks you can do this for a, a massive halo which is about 15 uh 10 to the 15 solar masses all the way down to sort of low mass halos and you can see the reconstruction does also work out both this is the the, the points here are the final position of the object these are the sort of initial positions of the object. So you can see not only what the shape of the object was, but where did it come from in space? So how much did it move? Michael. So it, it looks like in this particular case, the final object is the space. Yes. And, and, the, and you're saying that there is enough information to figure out the shape of the thing it came from. Yes. Uh, must be related to the axiom. Access ratios of the final structure or something like that. I'm trying to figure out sort of the physics of. of yeah. Well, well, so in some ways, that's the question that I, I, I'm going to sort of leave you with, with this problem is we observe these final virialized objects. We see the galaxies and the clusters of galaxies and groups of galaxies. What we're hoping to see out here is, to, OK, let's go all the way back to the initial conditions and ask what, what were the initial conditions that led to the collapse of those objects? Can we see? You know, can we split the sample up and say, you know, what do the various axis ratios look like? What does the tidal field look like around these proto halos and how do they fall into this? In many ways, what this is allowing us to do is say, what are the initial conditions that give rise to the sort of galaxies that we see today without letting the sort of gravitational evolution take place on top of that? So we're sort of separating out the gravitational evolution piece to the rest of that. Elliot. This will certainly get, so that's certainly something that we have to, so, so this, these are dark matter only simulations. There's a question now again of what scales will that come into play uh, for different pieces. So if you're on large enough scales, hopefully that's a smaller effect. 
this is always the, the trade we make in the sort of cosmology version of this. But I, I absolutely agree. I think we, you know, we, we've got plans to sort of run these on simulations where there's a more reasonable treatment of baryons in there and see how does that change the answer. Good. Uh, so this is one piece of what we're trying to do. Uh, we can also, for instance, if we go ahead and measure what these protohalos look like, we can also try to do BAO with these protohalos as well. And so this is work that a student of mine has been looking at just in the simulations of is the BAO scale in the protohalos itself uh, unbiased out here? And it seems certainly looks like it is. And the advantage here is some of the modeling of the protohalos may be a lot simpler than what we have to do for the galaxies and the halos uh, out there. Let me skip ahead on these and not work through lots of the systematics out here and jump ahead to a second version of reconstruction. So the, the first version of reconstruction that I've given you was this optimal transport with the idea here driving back to thinking about uh, things like what the protohalos look like. The second piece that I'd like to show you is uh, ideas that we've been sort of playing with with machine learning to sort of see, can we do a little bit better? And so let me give you a quick version of this. So I had shown you sort of reconstruction run previously where we sort of went through this flow stage and we got this initial version off of the reconstructed field. You could say, given all of the great successes that machine learning has done in the, in the last few years, can we just short circuit this entire problem and stop thinking about the physics and let the machine figure out the physics? And so can I take this field, which is the final density field, let me take the initial density field and have a machine and give it enough simulations and can the machine learn all of the large scale structure and figure out how to take the final density field to the initial density field. And people have tried this uh, and the answer is it works, but it doesn't work as well as you might have naively guessed. And there's a simple reason to think about why some of that doesn't work particularly well, is a lot of this motion from going from the initial conditions to the final conditions, or if you want to run backwards, has sort of two flavors of motion. There's sort of a large scale flow that has to sort of move things back into pieces. And so to get that large scale flow right, you need to actually see the entire box and you need to sort of see everything out here. And then there's stuff that's happening on small scales. And I can split those two scales out. It's hard for, the, for a, any sort of machine learning algorithm to sort of learn all of the very large scale flows because you're sort of using all of the information and the sort of sensitive cancellations that happen. But I can say the large scale flows are the one piece I know how to do pretty well. Right? It's linear theory to a good approximation. So instead of doing this directly, let me do this in two steps. Let me first generate an initial, uh, let me generate reconstruction. Let me work out the flow field and then let me run that for backwards. And if you do this, you can ask how well do you predict what the final density field is? And so uh, let me just walk you through what's going on out here. These are, this is in Fourier space now showing you the cross correlation of different Fourier modes with the initial conditions. So you want one to be perfectly correlated with the initial conditions. This is tells you one piece of information. There's another piece of information, which I can show you, which is the amplitude of the various pieces, but you can sort of look at either version of this or, or both versions. And so the, the dashed line out here is what you get if you just do this simple version of, of reconstruction. And what I'm, what, what I'm gonna show you in the next slide is how well this, this sort of machine learning version where you do this on the reconstructed, the originally reconstructed data works. And so, yeah, Stephen, five, okay, good. Uh, let me, so let me just jump to the results out here. So here's, this is what nonlinear structure formation does. It basically erases all information on the initial conditions. You don't, your, your modes are, except on very large scales, very uncorrelated with the final field out here. The standard reconstruction algorithms, and there are different algorithms out here that we've tried, but they all basically do about the same. They get you these, these two dashed lines out here. If you had just said, let me throw out any theory and just let the machine do it, you get the dotted line uh, out here. So you do a little bit better than the sort of late time evolution. You do somewhat better on some scales and not as well and on other scales, certainly not as well in large scales because that's where things struggle the most. Uh, with, the, uh, with these sort of straight machine learning algorithms. And if you say, let me now put it all together and do this uh, out here, 
this is what, if you say, let me take the standard reconstruction algorithm and tie that to something that works things out in small scales, you can start getting a, a reconstruction that is accurate to many, many uh, orders of magnitude, not many, or at least a factor of two or three larger in K. Uh, and, and things are correlated out to very large scales. So the piece I'm gonna leave you with, so again, what do I do with this? It turns out for the BAO measurements, I can do all of this and it doesn't really change my BAO accuracy a whole bunch. The standard reconstruction algorithms get you most of the way to doing about as well as you will ever do with the BAO measurements. Uh, at the end of the day, there is a, there's a width to the BAO scale and that's, that's the, the final width that you would have. So what else could I imagine doing with a density field with these initial conditions? And one idea that I'd like to uh, leave you with is, uh, can I use this to learn something about, for instance, primordial non-Gaussianity? So the idea here is the following. Let me, I've got some estimate of what the initial density field is. Models of primordial non-Gaussianity say, let me take that initial density field, and I could use that as a template for a version of looking for the primordial non-Gaussian signal. So I could imagine taking that initial density field, calculating what the potential was, and in the simple models of primordial non-Gaussianity, it's the potential squared that shows up as a template. So you could ask, can I look for that particular template in the data? Now, this is sort of nice in some ways in that I am actually saying, let me use the data to inform a template that I can look for in the data itself to find an amplitude of a signal. Now, this is work in progress, but one piece that you might ask is, I'm doing all of this reconstruction has this actually preserved any of the primordial non-Gaussian signal that I have in the data? And so we've been trying to do things where we decompose the reconstructed field into just a sequence of various terms that you get. A lot of these terms are, are terms that you would get from just the standard nonlinear evolution, but you could also say, let me look for a term that looks like this non-Gaussian signal out here. And it turns out that if you do this, you will you actually find that the reconstruction largely preserves most of at least with the versions of reconstruction we have mostly preserves the 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 overall signal in the non gaussianity while driving all of the non non linear growth terms basically down to zero so if you had done this in sort of no, normal non linear structure formation all of these numbers would be order 1 numbers uh, or so, and you can see they're much smaller. The exact numbers are out here uh, that you'd get from perturbation theory, but you get numbers that are very small. You get small biases that we're still trying to understand out here, but the idea here again is can, how much more information can I pull out of these density fields if I use some of these ideas of reconstruction to go after the initial density? So let me uh, there's lots more to say about that, and I'm happy to sort of talk about that in, in some more detail. But let me sort of come back here and end with just what I what all the various pieces that I've given you a flavor of. So I've shown you things to expect with the upcoming DESI uh, BAO measurements. Uh, DESI will do much more than just the BAO measurements that I've shown you out here. So this is just one piece of what you should expect uh, coming out over the next uh, half year or so. Uh, I've also shown you some of the early results that we've gotten, so we have some good sense that things are working really well. And then I've shown you some ideas of where this idea of reconstruction that originated thinking about BAO measurements might go into the future. And, and so let me uh, stop here and take any questions. Thanks. Sure. Very, very nice talk. Um, as an avid consumer of your data, um, so the Y1 BAO, is it just going to throw out, are we just going to throw out all the existing BAO measurements? Or we can add those, what will be the state of the art? We will probably, there, there, there's a pretty large cross correlation with and covariance with the existing ones. So my suspicion is we will throw them out. We, as part of it, we are reanalyzing the uh, EBOS and BOS results. And so we will have some statements about what the correlations are. But my suspicion is we will not want to use any of those. They'll just be outdated. Neda. 
for, for the highway drift point uh, with the quasars, can you use it with the quasars themselves, not just with the lime and alpha? Do you have enough quasars to, to get a direct measurement? Yeah, so the quasar measurement is actually interesting because it comes from, you don't get a measurement directly from the quasars themselves. Uh, there's too much shock noise in the high redshift quasars just to get a BA measurement. But what you do get is a measurement from the Lyman Alpha Forest, but you also get one from cross correlations between the Lyman Alpha Forest and the quasars themselves. So that's a that's a strong enough signal that you can see. Uh, the quasars themselves you can you you can do, but the the uh, the answer is it's it's very noisy. Uh, correlation that you saw between the BAO uh, in, the, in the beginning between BAO and the Hubble constant. Right. There is some secondary uh, dependence on other cosmological parameters in that relation, omega meter and, and, and others. Are they insignificant? They're built in, in some ways, the, the dependence on things like omega matter come into the sound, the drag scale dependence, because that set the combination of omega matter, omega barrier, and all of those come into defining what that drag scale is. And so they, they come in out there. The, Errors, maybe if I, if you remember, the CMB errors are tiny. And so basically the CMB tells you those densities to incredibly high precision. So in terms of the, just the actual drag scale error, that is, I think at the point, uh, a few sub 0.1%-ish level uh, in, the, in those measurements. The BBN numbers are much larger and you saw the BBN numbers get, get larger. So it depends on how you build those up, but those are built into that, but they're all in the drag scale. Jeremy. I noticed on your, I'm guessing on the slide, you had lots of Bs. Yes. I assume stand for bias. Very yes. Uh, you know, you, you're looking at these galaxies, they, they light up because of star formation and so forth. But what you were really interested in is the mass, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So, what, can you just remind us what assumptions do you have to make about bias in order to play this, this game? game? Uh, so a lot of this is built around the, the idea that I can build my bias from a local model so that, you know, the, the, the bias of the galaxy tracers come from some local batch of the matter density. So I'm not sort of connecting things out to very large scale, the, you know, there's not some large scale uh, connection to the galaxy bias. Local density. And, and so in, in that case, that is what that, you know, that expansion that I wrote down is saying, okay, let me write down the bias as a function of local density, then local density squared, and then all of the other sort of scalar quantities that I could build off things like the, you know, the gradient of the local density uh, dotted with a, dif a different distance. Right, so, so you, you, always, you always are putting in those terms in there. And so you know, people will then say, there are additional terms from the bits that you have neglected. You can now ask how, you know, how sensitive are you to where you put the cutoff? Uh, and we've looked at that. And in a lot of these cases, you're not very sensitive to where that cutoff is, as long as you know, the cutoff isn't much smaller than a few megaparsecs. Uh, let's uh, thank Nikhil again.